<clears throat> okay, so we'll get started. Um, I just, I wanted to start by saying, I think that we have profoundly misunderstood the way communication and science are connected to each other. Um, and I think it, that has all kinds of consequences. I think it, it affects not only how we go about trying to communicate, make a presentation or write about science, but it also affects research. And <clears throat> so I think we need to understand this relationship. And the basis of this course is gonna be to try to show you how these two things work together. And that not only makes communicating a lot simpler, but it will also help your, your science, I think. Um, so I have this as a little manifesto, I call it, and I just I'm, just want to emphasize those points again. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have some problem with my throat this morning. So I, like I said, I think science and communication are connected really in a profound ways that are, people misunderstand, or at least they underestimate a lot. Um, if you want to understand that relationship, then you need a model of how science communication works and how it goes wrong. And if you work with this model, then that can improve the way that we both communicate and teach science and learn science. So it can help you when you have to read a paper or it can help you when you're trying to understand something really complicated. And it'll also improve your research. So that's why we're doing this. And this course is gonna be really practical. And that means I'm gonna take, we're gonna work with your science and the projects that you're working on right now. Um, a lot of times this kind of teaching has you do sort of exercises or whatever. And I found that's not very helpful. So my job now at the, at the MDC is to do this kind of training to help people with their papers, to help them with their writing, to help them with their presentations. So at any stage you can come to me and, and if you want and I'll, I'll be happy to help if I have the time. And there's all kinds of courses that you can take while you're, while you're studying here at, at this level, but also for postdocs and those kinds of things. <clears throat> So we can't learn to communicate well if we don't think about science well or whatever we need to communicate. If we don't think well about it, then I don't think there's any way that we can actually communicate it well. And to do that, we're gonna do a few things. The first thing is we're gonna explore what I call your inner laboratory. We're gonna talk a lot about that today. And then the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna really think hard about the goals of science communication. So why are we doing this? What are we trying to communicate? What do we hope to accomplish with that? And then today in the second part at about 11 o'clock, um, we're gonna to try to put these two things together and I'm gonna show you how that works in a kind of exercise. And the main thing I wanna to talk to you about right now at the beginning is why is this necessary and why do we need kind of a model of science communication to, to sort of understand these things? And this comes from my background. So I've been, a, <clears throat> I've been writing about science and working with scientists for about 25 years now. And I started as a writer. And when, when I came to my first lab, the, my boss asked me, okay, while you're writing, I want you also to teach courses, excuse me. <coughs> It's really bad on the, on the Zoom. I also want you to teach scientists how to write. And when I did that, I, I found this, some things that really confused me a lot. So um, the scientists knew their science perfectly, as far as I could tell, um, but they had all kinds of problems when they started to write or give talks and there were strange problems. So a lot of them came just from the fact that in Europe, most scientists, they don't get trained very well in this. So it's like when you start studying science in school, you stop writing, you stop doing all these other things. The literature people do those things. Um, some of the problems come from the fact that most of you are not native English speakers. But the really surprising things to me were that scientists were having all kinds of trouble when they were talking about their work. And when I was reading their papers or reading or listening to them um, talk, I had all kinds of trouble figuring out, okay, is this important? What's the main point or what's the detail? What do I really need to remember from this? Um, they would give me a piece of information without providing any context or background for it. And then in the text and in the talks, there were all kinds of weird jumps in the logic. There were gaps and, and just things I couldn't connect to each other. 
And the biggest problem of all was that people just had to have seemed to have a really, really hard time finding the clearest, simplest way to explain things. It was all way too complicated and 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 usually really confusing somehow and unnecessarily confusing. Now, that wasn't true for all scientists, obviously. So I had the chance also during my first job to meet a lot of really great scientists like all these Nobel Prize winners. And uh, I got to interview these guys and I found out that they were usually really super good at explaining their science. So it made me wonder, is there a connection between doing really good science and communicating well? And how would I find out? If, if, if that was the case, then what was the connection and how would I go about finding that out? So I decided to try to do this kind of scientifically. Um, I did it kind of like the geneticists did it. So in, in early genetics, what they did was they looked at mutations in organisms. They looked at, you know, Thomas Hunt Morgan looked at flies and he learned to find like their, their wings were curly or their eyes were wide or whatever. And he knew that this was telling us something about how a healthy function of the gene should work by looking at the mutant form. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe I can do the same thing. I was seeing all these weird cases of mistakes and problems in science communication. Maybe those were trying to tell me something about how it should work and how it would work well. And so I realized what I needed was a model. I need a model of how science communication works and how people think when they communicate science and how they think about science. So <clears throat> I learned after about 10 years, I did this for 10 years, I just kept looking at problems. And, and um, I learned that, yeah, those problems do tell us something about how good science communications work. And the things that I discovered were kind of surprising. So the, the most important findings were, the first thing was, which I didn't expect was that when, when experts communicate with each other, they have the same kinds of problems as when they try to talk to their parents or to people who are not scientists. The, the problems aren't different. They're just, they're, they're slightly different, but they're not different kind of problem. They're just kind of a different scale of problem. Um, the second thing I found out was the most biggest problems come from the way scientists think about their work and the way they understand what the goal of a communication task is. And then the third thing was, which I was hoping, was that the problems that I was seeing, there was a kind of logic to them. And if you, and if you understood them, then you could not only improve scientific communication, but I started to see how it could affect how people think about science, and it was even making their research better. So if by exposing these problems, and again, so, so this course could be really, really important to you because I'm going to try to give you a way of thinking about things that will make a lot of things simpler, but it will also can also have a really important effect on how you think about your research. And then I also found out some things that that most people misunderstand. Um, most people think that the function of science communication is to report results from their experiments. And it turns out that that's not really true at all. I mean, you do that, but it's it, the goal is actually larger than that. Um, people also think that the reason non-scientists don't understand research is just that scientists know a lot more facts. And that's also not the problem. It's true that scientists know a lot of facts, but usually that's not the reason why we have trouble communicating with each other. And also then again, um, people think that when experts talk to each other, they don't have problems with communication. That's also not true. And you'll find this even in your group. So if you have a, if you're in a group where there's a bioinformaticist, maybe a physicist, and then suddenly you have to talk to a doctor or somebody or a technician or something, um, you can have all kinds of communication problems just in those contexts. So there's no way to fix these problems that people have without doing two things. And here's what we're going to do in the first part of the morning. We're going to talk about. <clears throat> what I call the inner laboratory. And we're gonna talk about something I call ghosts. And if you understand these two things, it can really, really have an important, important effect on, on all kinds of things. And I've seen this happen hundreds of times <clears throat> because I've worked with hundreds of people on papers and grants and proposals and all kinds of things. And these two concepts turn out to be really, really important. <clears throat> now, you, you, I don't know if 
you've been involved in much in we're gonna we're gonna break these things down through some real examples from from real life science communication and i don't know if you have relatives or if you've had any issues explaining covid or vaccines or stuff to people um but there have been a lot of cases recently where science communication just failed okay um, and and you've probably experienced some of that yourself. My I have experienced that because my wife is not vaccinated, and um, I wish she were. But but so we we can't talk about these things. Our problem is not science communication. Our problem is deeply philosophical. But that's all right. But but COVID COVID is not sorry. COVID is not the first time that this kind of thing has happened. It's happened all kinds of times. And I'm going to show you an example. Um, I'm going to show you an example from the '80s. Um, and and this is a really interesting example because so the context was in 1982, 86. I don't remember. I'll I'll see in a minute. Um, the CDC in America had just started to discover the existence of AIDS, and um, it was very strange because they hadn't found the virus. A lot of people were getting sick. It was also a strange disease um, because. Um, people were catching all these like secondary diseases from it, these weird kinds of cancer and stuff and dying from those. So the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, they conducted a study called a cluster study. And the, the cluster study pretty well indicated that um, um, the, the disease was being tr transmitted sexually. And so they held a press conference to report their findings. And what happened at this press conference, this, this guy here in the picture is um, named Jim Curran, and he got up on the podium, and after he presented his, his, the findings pretty scientifically, a reporter just asked straight out, are you saying AIDS is or is not a sexually transmittable disease? And here's what he said as an answer. The existence of a cluster study provides evidence for an hypothesis that people in the study are not randomly associated with each other, and the study is a sexual cluster. On the other hand, we don't have enough scientific evidence to say for certain that one person gives it to another person. We have to focus much more research into this area so that we don't prematurely release information that's not validated. On the other hand, we're not holding back any information that might provide important health benefits. Thank you. So let's think about this for a minute. So first of all, is what he said correct? Well, if you know what a cluster study is, and if you look at the data that they got, the answer is actually perfectly right. I mean, it, he doesn't say anything wrong, and he does state the facts, so to speak. But obviously, that doesn't make it a good answer, necessarily. I mean, and if you think about that, it's kind of complicated, right? Um, be, because the important thing is to realize that what a scientist saying what a scientist did is not saying what it means. And so we're going to think about that a little bit. Um, so, so is it good? Well, what what do you think happened? The next thing that happened at this press conference was. A reporter, another reporter got up and asked exactly the same question. And he didn't give a better answer. <laughs> so what, what are the consequences of this? So imagine you're a reporter, you go to this press conference, you get this information, and you're supposed to go home and write about this horrible disease. Well, a reporter will either get the story wrong, or they'll have to do their own research, or they'll go to some friend who's a scientist and say, what does this mean? And the reporter certainly won't agree on what he said. So that each of them might come to their own conclusion, but if they were to talk to each other, I'm sure that everyone would kind of take home a different message, right? And in the worst case scenario, they'll think scientists don't want us to know they're hiding something, they're doing dangerous things, and they don't want us to know about this. And, and this doesn't help because, because Jim Curran, when he gave his answer, he had a moment of control where he could he could influence the way the meaning what the meaning of this study was and he just gave it away because like i said um um the the reporters are going to go home and they're going to ask somebody else or they're going to make something up or whatever else. so we need to ask ourselves what's the goal 
And, and you may have the same situation when you give your presentation. If, if people don't understand it, what, what's the point of giving these presentations? Why are we doing this? And to think about that, think about yourself. Imagine you're sitting in the audience, you know, during in, in three weeks or whenever you have to give this talk, you're sitting in the audience and somebody else is speaking. What do you want? What are you expecting? What's the best thing that can happen from, from listening to that talk for you as an audience member? If you think of those things, it may change the way that you prepare your talk. If, if you have answers to those questions, then it gives you maybe a different way to prepare your own talk because you, you already started to think a little bit like the audience, okay? <clears throat> so before we get into that and, and actually discuss this and figure this out, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about what the solution could be. And so to do this, I wanna help you think about the problem in a little different way. And then we're gonna turn this into a method that will help you prepare for your talk or if you have to write something, this will help. But first I wanna show some examples. So, so again, go back to the press conference and think, is AIDS, <clears throat> is AIDS a sexually transmittable disease or isn't it? Excuse me, it's terrible today. Okay, well, if he'd taken a little more time, Jim Curran could have done something like this. So here's, here's mine. Are you saying AIDS is or is not a sexually transmittable disease? So first he thinks for a minute and he says, well, we often learn about a disease before we identify the virus or the other agent that causes it. And that can be a long process. In the meantime, it's really important to learn how it's transmitted so we can keep it from spreading. And right now, the best method we have to figure out how a disease is transmitted is called a cluster study. A cluster study works like this. We identify the people who have a disease and collect information about them. We look at whether they had any type of interaction with each other. We know a lot about different types of diseases and the routes that most of them use to cause infections. So what we do is check whether there's a match between one of those routes of infection and the types of interactions between the patients. <clears throat> If a disease is sexually transmitted, you usually see this type of pattern. A person who's infected had sex previously with another person who was already infected. If it's transmitted in some other way, then you wouldn't see that type of pattern. It would probably look random. Our no new study shows that a lot of people who have AIDS had sex with someone else who had the disease. They got infected, then they went on to have sex with other people, and some of those people also got the disease. This pattern is statistically significant. So if we had to choose between two assumptions that the disease is striking just random people or that it's transmitted by sex, right now we'd have to choose the second. But right now we've only examined a small number of cases. We can't absolutely say there isn't some other connection between infected person and people, one that we haven't found yet. So we haven't reached the level of certainty that most scientists would call proof. And that may not happen until we actually find the virus or the other agent that causes the disease but the results are significant enough that we think the public should have this information at the moment. Our best guess is that we're dealing with a new and very dangerous sexually transmittable disease. So I said exactly the same thing, but I just explained what it meant. I didn't stop by saying what we did or what the results were. I also said what it meant. And so this is really, really important. Saying what you found is not saying what the finding means. And, and to do that in the first place, you have to think the right way. You have to think well. And obviously, what and how we communicate depends on who the audience is. So for today and for all of our work, let's assume the goal is whoever your audience is, we want to, them to get a basic understanding of what you did, why you did it, and what it means to you. And, and I'm going to show you, you can do this. I don't know if you've ever tried to really explain your work to like a relative or, you know, your parents or your grandparents or somebody like that, but you can do it. Um, I spent my whole life doing this, but to do it, we need to talk about this thing I'm calling the inner laboratory. So what's the inner laboratory? Well, science is something that you do in your real laboratory and you also do it in the computer and what we I call a virtual laboratory. But more importantly, it happens in your brain. And the way to know this is if you walked into a lab 50 years ago with your brain now, you would do different things in that same lab than the scientists did 50 years ago. 
And it, people will have maybe the same equipment, the same basic types of equipment and stuff 10 years from now, but they'll be doing different experiments with that. And that's because the, the inner laboratory has changed. And what do I mean by this? Well, we all know that <laughs> there's different levels of this. So we have the cellular level and even lower than that, the molecular level in your brain. And then we have the functional level where something's going on, different regions are activated. And then we have concepts, which are, you have ideas, you have, you have concepts, you have models in your brain. And then somehow we put that into language and communicate it to somebody else. And when we do that, somebody else takes that language and they, figure out what it means. And that involves their brain working and that has some effect on the cellular and molecular level. So they do it backwards, right? So there's these different levels and we're not gonna get into this level or this level here, but we are gonna talk about how language is connected to the way we think about things and, and, and what that means. Now, each of you has an inner laboratory and I don't know what it's like, but we can kind of make a model of it a little bit. and and. It's unique and it's individual. And it defines what things mean. So if I tell you a fact like um, wind signaling is involved in several types of cancer, then you understand that if, if you understand it, you understand it because you know that I'm probably talking about a biochemical signaling pathway and you know a little bit about cancer and whatever, whatever. So I told you a fact, but to understand what it means, you have to know other things. And, and, and those other things, you've assembled this massive set of concepts and this whole architecture of ideas from everything you've read, from every paper you've read, from every talk you've heard, from your early childhood on until now. And so every single thing that you hear and read and, and um, um, you put into this inner laboratory. And, and it, it means, there's some interesting things about this. First of all, it means that every reporter probably understood Jim Curran of the CDC a little differently. And it means that two people can read the same paper and understand it very differently. You'll find this out when you send your papers out for review. You'll have three reviewers and one of them will love it. And one of them will say, oh, it's okay, but you know, you need to do some more work. And the third person will be a real bastard. And they will, you know, the third reviewer is always a real mean person. And, and sometimes you'll think, oh, the person didn't read the paper, but they probably did. It's just that they understood it or they were thinking differently than you were. Okay, but, but we can agree on lots of stuff. And if we agree on stuff, it's because our inner laboratories are similar enough to understand each other. But, but still, they're not the same. And I'm gonna show you this really, really simply, okay? So I'm gonna show you something and we're gonna all see the same thing, but at the same time, we're not going to see the same thing. It's kind of weird, but okay. And when I show it to you, there'll be this moment where you're trying to figure out what it is. And some of you will know instantly what it is or very quickly. And in that moment, while you're trying to figure out your brain is going to be doing lots of different stuff and you're, you're going to be operating on this thing with your inner laboratory. Okay. So I'm going to show it to you. <clears throat> Can somebody tell me what this is? Yes? Well, I will help a little, okay? I'm sure that, yeah, Claire? Do you know what it is? Isn't it a protein structure? It's a, well, you see some proteins here in the middle and what's this yeah. around the outside? Yeah, not so sure. <laughs> it's this is it, DNA. Is it, a, is it, is it the DNA, DNA, DNA with protein? Yeah. Sorry? DNA with protein. DNA with histone? Like right, DNA. exactly. It's a nucleosome, okay? So it's, it's his, in, the, in, the, in the nucleus, we have eight histone proteins and they're, they're linked together and DNA wraps around them and those make the nucleosomes, okay? So when you know that, instantly you start to look at this differently. While you were looking at it, you recognize some patterns, you recognize some protein patterns and maybe recognize the DNA and you thought, oh, okay, so I know that in the nucleus, so whatever. But before you, before you knew that, you looked at this differently. Now, when you look at it, you know some things like 
if you know enough, enough, you know that like there's eight proteins here and you look, there's different colors. You can, oh, there's a blue one, there's a yellow one. And then you imagine that it's symmetrical on the backside. Um, anyway, so your brain has to work, your brain is working on this and thinking about what do I know? What do I understand? What could this be? And, but if you showed this to like your, somebody who's not a scientist, they would think, oh, uh, I had one of these on my wall one time and somebody came and said, well, that's kind of a weird hat for carnival or something, you know, it's like a, something you put on your head. They had no, so anyway, so you'll see that differently. I'm gonna show you another example to make this even simpler. So this image was really important to me because I was doing a course one time, this was about six or seven years ago, and I showed this to a group of students and I realized that you, only see this a certain way because you know a lot of things and you have to know those things to understand this and when you do you see it completely differently and there's another example of this i'm going to also show you another thing that you will all see the same thing but you all see differently this will make it really simple okay so here we go so i don't know how many of you play chess but if you do play chess okay so clara's shaking her head so you, Clara, you don't play chess at all? Okay, so you couldn't tell us whether this is, is a real game or a fake game or whether it's a possible game or an impossible game. The other ones who do play chess, they're looking at this, they're trying to figure out what happens next, who's gonna win, how many moves, okay? Because that's what, I can make it a little harder for those people by doing this. Oh, wow, that's weird. You could still do it, but you have to work harder at it, okay? So, the reason why we see these these this differently is because there's some of us that are mediocre players. Maybe there's people who are really good and there's a few others who don't play at all. And each of those sees this a different way and looks for different patterns. And again, I just made it harder by, it's the same game, I just turned it on its side, which is a little unusual. But a good player can tell you whether this is a possible game or it's an impossible game, or whether what's going to happen next, and so on. And the reason why we see things is not whether you see this differently is not because of what's here. It's because of all this invisible stuff that's in our heads. Okay. So what what does a chess player know to make them see this in a certain way? Well, a chess player has a model of the game of chess in their head, and the model describes the pieces and the rules by which they move. And it also describes things like, okay, first white moves and then black moves and then white moves and then black moves. And it, chess is also kind of weird because it stops right before the end of the game. So, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to capture the other person's king, but you never actually do that. Um, you stop right before that happens. And so, so if I have this model in my mind, not only can I analyze this and see, oh, this is interesting and this is good or, or whatever, but I can also say, okay, is this possible? What just happened right before this and what will happen next? And that's kind of like science, you know, that's what you're doing when you're... So let's go back to thinking about communication now. I think that the function of communication is not to show you this picture, but the function of communication is for us to play a game. So a paper, or a talk is kind of like a board that we're playing a game of science on. And, and it's a board where we're not just telling people results, but we're telling them what they mean. And, and that means we're debating the models that we're using and we're debating whether our interpretations of things are right. And so, so it's like a playing field and we're fighting and negotiating and applying models on those playing fields. Okay. So communication is like a game. It's a game of science. And what's the real goal of it? And what's the, what are the pieces and how do they move? That's what we're gonna talk about a little bit later. First, um, I told you that the reason why chess players and other people see this board differently is because of all this invisible stuff. They know the rules, they know the pieces, they know the meaning of the pieces and the functions of the pieces. So as I was looking at communication, I realized that the same thing was happening. When I was listening to somebody talk or reading a paper, 
I could tell that we understood things differently. And the reason we understood things differently was because of all this invisible stuff. So I needed a name for invisible stuff. And so I thought, okay, the reason I need to think about this is because all that invisible stuff is somehow disrupting our communication. So I picked a name and the name that I picked is called ghosts because ghosts are invisible and they're disruptive. So ghosts are information concepts, patterns, or other kinds of knowledge that aren't in a text or a talk or an image. But you have to know those things to understand what it means. So there are certain things you have to know to recognize the nucleosome picture. There's certain things you have to know to understand what's happening on the chessboard. There you have to know the rules. You have to know the pieces and so on and so on. And in science, the same thing is true. You have to know lots of stuff to understand what's going on. And so I had a name for it. And then I began looking for them. And I found them everywhere, first of all. And secondly, I discovered that you have to, you have to confront this problem. You have to recognize that this exists if you want to communicate science, and it also really helps you learn science. Um, so I'm gonna show you how this works. And <clears throat> ghosts, these disruptions in communication, they show us that there's something in my head that's different than what's in your head. Um, so ghosts tell us something about our inner laboratories, and they also reveal gaps in my own knowledge. And those are important to note those differences. So if you're having trouble communicating with your group leader or somebody else in your group, it's real important to try to figure out why are you having trouble? And it's usually because of a ghost. And, and so how do we find them? Well, the first way you find them is by trying to communicate with somebody. If you're only in your own head the whole time, you know, um, you're like an autistic person. And so my head functions fine, but nobody else understands how my head functions. And we need to kind of collaborate on these things. So, so we do that by communicating. We can also find ghosts by watching other people communicate. And we can also find them just by really, really carefully studying the way the scientists speak about things. So, so just by listening to you talk about things, I see how your inner laboratory is structured and I can make some guesses about that and I can also find out things about it. So I can, I can kind of, by listening to you talk, I can kind of do some experiments that help me see how your ideas and your thoughts are organized. And I'm gonna show you how that works. So, and remember, it's real important to remember that what's in your head is not just a bunch of stuff that you've memorized. And I'm gonna prove this to you because, so I want you each to think of your favorite protein. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think of beta catenin and I like beta catenin a lot. Um, but think of your pro favorite protein. Um, Alexander, what's your favorite protein? Um, I think I would say it's troponin T because it gives very nice pictures in my standings. <laughs> okay, troponin T. Alexander, I want you to tell me the sequence now of troponin T. From your head tell me its sequence i think i couldn't because it's just like a mark in my <laughs> standings okay really could, could you like draw its structure in really 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 careful detail um maybe some detail but not careful detail okay so so i want to know what is that in your head if it's so if you if you can't tell me its sequence if you can't tell me its structure, if you can't really, really precisely define its structure, then what is that? It's not just something you've memorized. You've, you've assembled this concept of this molecule. Okay, and so for me, beta, beta catenin, I kind of know what its structure looks like, but I couldn't draw this. I would probably learn, okay, it has this number of like domains and this stuff, but, but you know, and, and, if I did draw it, it wouldn't help because each one is a little bit different, right? And here's the, the sequence of it, but everybody has one or two letters of that that's probably different. So, so what is it? <laughs> um, so I, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's what I'll call a concept, okay? And your concept of it is gonna be a little bit different than somebody else's concept of it. And that's interesting. And it's also really important. Um, but the main thing is, is that if I just listen to kind of listen to how you talk about a molecule, 
I'm going to listen to how people talk about beta catenin, and then I'm going to guess about stuff that they know. So I'm going to show you something what, that I call a concept map, and I'm going to use these things over and over and over again. A concept map is a way of drawing the way ideas in your head are connected to each other. So for example, <clears throat> let's see, beta catenin refers to many unique variants of DNA, which encodes it's also we use the name for an RNA and we also use its name for a protein. And we find it in different species like flies, mice, and humans. And there's homologs of it and it has a sequence, it has structure, and that structure permits interactions with other molecules, and those interactions produce specific functions, like it regulates inflammation and cell growth, and that's disrupted in cancer and other diseases. And um, if we, because it's in different species, then um, if you listen to people talk about it, you'll say, oh, I did an experiment in mouse, and that tells me about something about its function in humans. So all I did here was I said, okay, I'm going to listen to the way people talk about this molecule, and then I'm going to try to draw a map of, of, how, of, of what they have to have in their head to say those things. So there's a map and you can do this with yourself or you can take a text. I'm actually, I just had a great talk with, I don't know if you know Klaus Rayevsky, but he's a very big guy at our Institute and he knows a lot about B cells. And he and I are going to sit down and make a map of everything he knows about B cells. I'm, I'm really excited about that. But anyway, so this map, it, it explains how you use the concept and all of this is a ghost. But if you, if you are going to talk about, if you're going to use the word of the molecule as the name for the protein, the gene, and the RNA, then you have a structure like this in your head. If you're, if you're going to talk about the same molecule in different species, then you have a structure like this in your head. And in fact, you have an even deeper structure because what are all these little connections between things? Well, some of those connections have to do with biochemistry, like DNA encodes mRNA, encodes proteins. Some of them have to do with cellular functions. Some of them have to do with different species. So that means that underneath this map, there's another map. And if I'm talking about beta catenin, then I'm talking about biochemistry. I'm talking about gene expression. I'm talking about cell biology. I have to know certain things. I have to know some stuff about evolution. Um, there's physics at the basis of this because physics and chemistry ultimately regulate its functions. There's the structure, there's structural biology. And none of this is in a text when I write about beta catenin. I'm gonna show you a text. And we're going to look. We're going to look for other types of ghosts in this text. So, like I said, all of this stuff, you it has to be there because otherwise you wouldn't use the word correctly. And somehow you learned all this stuff, and somehow you built a map like this in your head. You built an inner laboratory, and it looks kind of like this. It it'll be different. That's fine, but but I know that it's there because I it just to use the word the right way it has to be there. And I also know that these things are even deeper there. So there's all kinds of maps and they're all connected to each other somehow. And so let's just look at a little text in which we mentioned beta catenin. And we're gonna ask ourselves, okay, what do I have to know to understand this text? And can I figure out what a scientist knows to write this text? So, so when I read this, I'm gonna be trying to understand it, but I'm also gonna ask myself, what does the scientist know to write this? So we'll break it down. So cells constantly produce and degrade the molecule beta catenin. Normally it's bound to a complex that's targeted for destruction. Signaling by WINT blocks the formation of this complex, leaving higher quantities of beta catenin. That means it can enter the nucleus and activate target genes. So for, first of all, what does all this mean? What does it mean? Well, we're talking about a transcription, uh, actually a transcriptional co-activator, right? But, but what do you need to know to understand this? Well, the first thing you need to know is you need to know some terms and concepts like produce and degrade. What does produce mean? Oh, well, that's gene expression. <laughs> wow. So th there's a gene and it becomes an RNA and then all kinds of thousands of other things happen to it. And finally, it's a, it's a protein. And normally it gets bound to a complex. So I need to know what a complex is. I need to know what binding is. 
targeted for destruction. Hmm, that probably has something to do with ubiquitin or something, one of those systems. So you need to know a bunch of concepts, but you also know how they're connected to each other. So this whole little story is also one concept called a transcription factor or a transcriptional co-activator. You can sum this whole thing up by saying a, a term like that. So all of these points are connected to each other in a, in a larger meaning. You need to know a little bit about the geography of the cell. So it has a nucleus. Um, it's helpful to know that Wnt is an extracellular signal that comes from another cell, secreted by another cell. And then it binds to a receptor. And then a pathway is activated. Um, and also you have a little, it's like watching a little film in your head. Like you, you see one thing happen and then another thing and another thing. And this is kind of weird because the order of things is scrambled up. It starts with beta catenin, but actually the whole thing gets started with, well, it does get started when beta catenin is produced, but then the wind signal comes. So anyway, so all of those things are ghosts. Um, and, and again, if I look at this, if, if I didn't know enough about how cells work and enough about gene expression, then I wouldn't understand any of this. And show it, just take any paragraph from a scientific paper and show it to somebody who's not a scientist and say, I could show you something from like quantum mechanics or whatever, and, and you would have the same feeling, right? But, but again, the important thing is we can analyze it. So, so you need to have, like you have, you've seen these models of, of these totally fake models of what here's a membrane and here's went and it's bound to probably frizzled or something um, re, a receptor and here's the signaling complex and beta catenin and I mean you got to realize this is totally fake right a cell doesn't look like this and signaling doesn't really work like this because this is just one sort of real basic, simple model. And, and so there's a lot of ghosts here too, just in how we understand pictures like this. Here's another model of, this is NF kappa B, but it doesn't matter. It, I just wanted to pick, here's another way of modeling the same kind of thing. Um, you see it's getting more and more complicated. Um, okay, so, those are just different models and you may you don't have this in your head but you know how to scan it or you know how to use it and you know how to read it so let me just pause for a minute and, and go back and and remind you that so the reason why we're talking about this is because ghosts these ghosts they disrupt communication they're really important because they tell us something about our inner laboratory, we see that, oh, I'm missing something or, or there's a link that I don't have. They disrupt communication and sometimes it's the only way to find them. And there's all kinds of other ghosts that are much more fundamental and, and they're base, basic matters of cognition. So, so let me give you another example. And, and this, these thing, kinds of things are really surprising. And as I started to investigate this, I kept finding really strange and weird things. So we're talking about the architecture of your inner laboratory. So let's look at a real architectural drawing of a real laboratory. Here's, here's a real laboratory. This is actually the Bimsby building. Uh, this is, I don't know what floor or whatever. And the architects made this for me. Um, this has everything. It has the wiring. It has the blue fingers are kind of the walls and has wiring and it has the ventilation and it has the electricity and it has the water and and the everything is here. And even an architect can't read this because, because to, to, to look at it, you have to peel it apart and, and the guy is building the wall and the other person is putting in the electricity, but you need to see the whole thing also. But this is, this is way too complicated. Um, so let's, let's make this a lot simpler. I asked my sister to draw me a floor plan of her house. My sister lives in Kansas where I'm from. And I told her, just draw me a real basic floor plan of your house. So there's, here's what she drew. This, this, is, this is the house. And so there's, um, you come in from here and the kitchen is back here and there's a garage here and then they have master bedroom. And then my sister has two uh, grandchildren. They're, they're um, identical twins which is good because it gives us a control group. I'll, I'll show you in a minute what we're gonna do with this. So, so this is kind of what her house looks like. Now, I told her when the, the twins were eight years old and I told her, 
I want you to get the twins to draw your house, to draw the floor plan of your house. So again, twins, identical twins. So we had a control here. Here's the control, my sister, the adult. What do you think a house looks like to a child? This is really exciting. When I saw these, I was, I was just so happy. So here's, here's the first twin. Here's Derek. Derek drew the house like this. He spelled living room wrong and, and everything. But So let's compare that to my sister's house. And it's interesting because everything is kind of in the right place. Here's the kitchen. Here's the bedroom. Here's the bedroom. Here's the bathroom. Here's the living room. But then there are all these weird like tube-like things. And, and I don't know. It's And I don't know what these things are. I think he drew furniture or something. Uh, there's a sofa and there's the TV or whatever. Okay, so, so look at the difference between the eight-year-old's drawing and my sister drawing. Now we're going to look at the way his twin drew the house. Um, um, Dylan. Dylan drew the house like this. And we're going to compare that again to, to my sister's drawing. And you'll see again that everything is kind of in the right place. The kitchen is here. The living room is here. There are the bedrooms and there's a bathroom. And what's going on here? Why, why do children draw this way? And, and what do we learn by comparing the two children's drawings. So if, if, you, if you look at this and think about it, for, first of all, you see there, there's two things about houses that the twins don't understand. And, and this is really interesting. There's two things. The first thing they don't, and, and again, you could figure this out if you looked at it. I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, but um, they, they don't understand that the wall of one room is the back of the wall next to it. And that's really interesting because you can play a game with a child. You can say, I want you to go in the next room and I'm going to knock on the wall and you try to guess where the sound is going to be. And they can't because, because they don't see space that way. Um, and the other thing that they don't know is the whole thing has to fit into the shape of the outside. So if, if the house is a square, I mean, you know, if you went outside, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be all these little corners everywhere and everything. You walk around and, and, and that's interesting because it also explains some other things. Like when I was a child, I always wondered, maybe there were like secret rooms or hiding places in my house or like secret passageways between things. And you can see why a child might think that because there's all kinds of places where those things could be, right? If you don't have those two rules. So I didn't know what was gonna happen when I asked the children to draw the house. But it told me something really interesting about children's understanding of space and, and topographies and sort of geography that I would never have known. I never knew that children didn't understand those things until I made them draw. So when you communicate science, I am listening to your inner laboratory and I can see how it's organized. And if you have trouble communicating science or you have trouble, usually it's because there's something disorganized or something unclear in your inner laboratory. And that means if we, if we can identify that, if we can understand that, that means that we can use communication to figure stuff out. We can do real experiments in real science laboratories in your head and we can straighten things up and we can come up with new questions and we can solve problems, but we have to see it first. So the reason why we're doing this course and the function of communication is so that we can externalize our inner laboratory and work on it and organize it and add things to it and see its structure more clearly. So let me just show you, we'll go back to science now and just let me show you, I've been working with scientists a long time, like I said, and um, again, just to summarize one more time, children have, their knowledge is organized very differently than adults, but we only know this by making them draw or communicate in some way. And in science, when I read people's papers and hear their talks, I, I, I've understood that there are also these ghosts that are here. So I'm going to show you a few of them. And this, this is really interesting. So. Sorry, the light is coming in the window. It's...
Sorry about that. So I was working with a group that, that does a lot of MRI and they were using images like this and they were talking about brain phenotypes. And I looked at this image and I realized, okay, I don't know actually what's in this image. I don't know how to understand this or even how to look at this because, because I realized that when I look at this, I see structure, but how did I learn to see that structure? What's happening in my brain to see that structure? And so I realized that I learned to look at black and white images by looking at pictures like this. Okay, so here's the same image. One of them is fuzzy and one of them is sharp. And um, I can tell if I only have the fuzzy one, I can already tell what it is because I've learned to see structure in black and white images. And this is a black and white image but I didn't learn to see structure by looking at brains. I learned it by looking at cats. So when I look at this image, am I seeing what's important or am I seeing what's not important? Well, my brain is kind of doing with, it's kind of simplifying. Here's the high resolution image. And when I look at this, my brain says, okay, there's a big white spot here. So that's one thing. And then there's a bunch of white stuff here and it's all connected to each other. So that's probably another thing. And my brain kind of simplifies this. It interprets things, but maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Maybe I shouldn't be interpreting things because I, I didn't learn how to look at MRI scans and understand structure. I looked at cats and other kinds of pictures. So I did an experiment in which I took this image and I said, Maybe there are things here that I can't see because my brain is simplifying things. So what I did was I went in with Photoshop and I forced it to, I, I said, maybe there's like little areas in there where there's just a little bit of difference in the grayscale that I can't see. And so I'm just ignoring it. So I colorized it in the way, and this is what I got. And I showed this to the, to the group doing MRN and they said, and I asked them, first of all, are those little differences important? And they said, yeah, they're really important because, because it's, there's signal there. And then actually they started to colorize their MRI images like this because they realized they were doing the same thing. They were missing lots of information because their brain was running a different pattern, okay? So, so you have to be very careful. Your brain is interpreting things because it's got all of these programs and apps running basically all the time to understand stuff. And it may be using non-science stuff like looking at pictures of cats to try to understand something scientific like an MRI scan. And you only see that if you, if you do this exercise. So I was on a retreat with this group and I told them, okay, we're talking about the way that we describe things. So I told them, I want you to go into the kitchen and I want you to find, uh, I want you to find an object. And when you come back, you're gonna describe it to everyone else. And you can't say the name of it. And you can't also say what it does. You have to give a purely physical description. Don't tell us its function. And so, because I wanted to see what happens when we just try to describe things. So I sent them, I sent them into the kitchen and one person came back with this. Well, he came back and described this. And when he described this, half of the people in the room drew this. They, they drew something that looked really like this and you could tell they knew what it was. But the other half of the people in the room drew something else. And the other half drew, one of these. And that's interesting because those two things have a similar function. Um, and it's also interesting because if you were describing this, you could describe it clearly enough that people would not draw that. Just think, okay, if I were gonna describe, it's, a, it's, a, it's made out of metal, and it's got, you know, what, however you describe it, you could do it so that people would not draw that. But you'd have to realize that this is also in the kitchen and some people might mistake those two things for each other. So sometimes the way that you talk about something or the way that you describe something just depends on whether you realize there's something else that people could get confused 
If you don't think about that, then it will change the way that you describe this. If you don't think, okay, I'm going to describe this. I wonder if there's something in the kitchen that they might, something else that they might think I'm describing. How am I going to make sure that I they really draw this one and not the other one? So you could do it, but again, you have to think of that. And th this is like, if you're describing a, a cell, let's say you're describing a cell type, like um, a macrophage, and you're describing it a certain way. If you, if you don't realize that there may actually be three or four different types of cells, they're, they're maybe they're in different states or maybe they're slightly different types, then you're gonna describe it in one way without thinking of the fact that um, that you you might be confusing two things. It would be like a batch experiment or a mass experiment. Okay, anyway, that's so so this was a weird kind of ghost. I call it a ghost of of I don't even remember the name I got. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. It's it's a ghost that's there because you were thinking in a certain way and not thinking of something. There's another kind of ghost that happens all the time. And so let's imagine you're doing an experiment. Um, like you've done you've knocked out, you've done two experiments where you've knocked out your protein and then you've overexpressed your protein. And you've done that in a cancer mouse and you've done that in a wild type mouse. And you're gonna say what this means. Well, what it means depends on something that's not there. Can anybody, does anybody see that there's something missing from this table? There's a control that's missing from this table. Um, yeah, yeah. What's the control? Mm -hmm. The one with the one with the normal expression at basal level, neither the knockout, no, neither the overexpression. So, so you want you we, what's missing is a third column here where we say endogenous expression, the endogenous, right? And and you would be amazed how many times in papers. People are actually describing, they have a table like this in their head. They're describing an experiment and they have a table. And I, I cannot tell you how many papers I've read where people have forgotten that for any of this to mean anything, there's another column that you need. And, and so they draw a conclusion and I can tell them instantly, the reviewer is going to tell you, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> right? Because there's, because again, if you're going to make any statement about what this means, you have to compare it. And so the meaning of this depends on having the whole table. Um, there's, let me show you another, I'm going to go to a different, another, we're going to go back to our, um, our, uh, our beta catenin story. And I'm going to show you some more interesting things about this. So the other thing is that happens is, that we have to agree on certain things. We have to agree not only on what concepts we have and how they're connected to each other, but we also have to agree that at some sometimes certain things are important, other thing times other things are important. So, for example, when I saw this paper and I sat down with a friend of mine to try to find these ghosts, this was his paper, and I said, "Okay, cells. What type of cell are you talking about? What species is it in?" I said, oh, it doesn't matter. I said, well, that's good. How do I know that it doesn't matter? Produce, uh, well, produce under what circumstances? Produces, it, it's gene expression, right? That's a big complicated thing. Um, under what conditions does this happen? What kind of, are you talking about DNA, RNA, or protein when you say beta catenin? Oh, I'm talking about protein here. How do I know? Well, I. what variant, what isoform, in the complex, do we know all the components? How are they arranged? Do any of these things matter? Under what conditions? And, and what models are they based on? And what if the models are wrong? So we have to agree not only on what words mean like molecule and beta catenin, but we also have to agree on what we care about and what we don't care about at any particular time. Um, and this goes even deeper because, sorry, for some reason, 
What's the experimental evidence for each statement? Is it based on sound methodology? What type of data supports it? Are there alternative explanations? What are the underlying models? And is there something going on in this text like my sister's drawing of her house or the children's drawing of her house? Am I, am I thinking just wrong somehow? Am I thinking like a child about this? There's no quantitative information here. So what, what, we, so now I've shown you all the big problem. I've shown you a huge problem. I've shown you that, that there's all kinds of very complicated things going on in here. So what's the solution? What's the solution? That's what we're gonna do now. I'm gonna take you really quickly through an answer to this. And this is gonna be complicated because I, I can just introduce it to you now. Um, but I'm gonna show you. So we're gonna take another text and we're gonna go through that text. And, and this text is a press release that was written um, at the EMBL the, in Heidelberg after I left. I used to write press releases for them. I'm always kind of happy when I leave a place and it, the place goes to hell. Um, no, I'm just, just kidding. Uh, so, so here's a press release and it's called Rewrite the Textbooks, Transcription is Bidirectional. And it, went like, it began like this. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. The same is true for many other organisms that are easier to study than humans. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts and have come a step closer to understanding their function. The study redefines the concept of promoters, the start sites of transcription, contradicting the established notion that they support transcription in one direction only. The results are also representative of transcription in humans. Now, I assume that you understand this, or maybe, um, but the question, this was actually written for like, you know, the public. And the public, when they read this, they have a bunch of questions. And um, let's let's just look at this really carefully and ask ourselves some really simple questions. So we're gonna ask what each sentence means. And then we're gonna ask what connects the contents of that sentence to the next sentence. And then we're gonna try to figure out if there's things that are missing. So look at the first sentence. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. What's the, where's the connection between those two sentences? How, how is somebody who's not a scientist gonna understand the connection between them? What do you have to know to connect those two sentences? You have to know that the instructions are the DNA, basically. Right, and okay, so you have to know that genes and instructions are DNA. What else do you have to know? And you'd have to know that it's first transcribed into RNA and then RNA is translated into protein. Right. And what's that called? What's that? What you just told me, what's that called? Do you know the, the name? Central, of central the dogma. The, the central molecular dogma biology. of molecular biology. Right. So if you have that in your head, you can connect those. Two. So if you have that little sequence, DNA, RNA, proteins, and you know the genes are DNA, then you have that in your head, right? You have to have that map in your head, okay? Yet for unknown reasons, what does unknown reasons mean? Why should, why, why wouldn't most of our DNA be transcribed into RNA? Would anyone, so, so this, the, that's, it's written in a way that not only assumes people know the central dogma, but it also know, assumes they know a little bit of the history of the central dogma. Originally people thought, that was the only function of DNA was to encode RNA and then proteins. And it was a real surprise to people to find out that there was all of this non-coding DNA. And then it was a real surprise to find that, oh, it's being transcribed into RNA, but that's not being made into protein. A again, it's you have to know so many things to understand this. And what this is actually all about is obviously it's about gene expression. So one day I sat down and I made a map of what I know about gene expression. So I know that, for example, um, the transcription machinery binds to enhancers, promoters, DNA, and DNA encodes sort of pre-mRNA and non-coding RNA, and 
RNA has introns and exons and UTRs and et cetera. So I just mapped out what I know about a gene expression. Um, and if I have this in my head, I can understand that text. But obviously, and yours, your inner laboratory for this will be different. And this is not everything that I know. This is just a real basic overview of things, okay? But obviously, other people don't have that map. And so they're not going to understand the text. And, and obviously, I can't give other people that map, or I can't teach them all those things. But when you read the text, if you don't know science, or if you don't understand it, you're trying to build a map yourself. So let's look at the map. You, you, you're saying, okay, if I, if I want to understand this, I need to put those ideas together. And so if you read it, you're kind of trying to do this. So Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Genes encode proteins. They're a small part of the genome. And then later you're going to find that uh, most of it is transcribed into RNA and we don't know about the rest. And then later in the text, you learn that yeast generates transcripts that have functions. And then later you learn that promoters are the start sites of transcription, previously believed to happen in one direction, and now that's been contradicted. So you'll learn these sets of facts. And then the question is, how do you connect them to each other? And the text doesn't help you. you. You could connect them because if you notice that each, so maybe something that's transcribed is a transcript and maybe transcription is, a, I mean, you could try to link it, but you have to work really, really hard to do that. And you have to think a lot and you have to guess a lot. So what's the solution? Again, you're not going to be able to teach them anything. So if, if the author's goal is to communicate, so the goal is to communicate not the facts, but you need to communicate the map. You're trying to help whoever's reading this text build a little map in their mind. And when you give your talk at the newbie seminar, you're trying to help all these people who don't understand your science or they don't know what you're working on you're not just giving them facts, but you're trying to help them draw a map. You're trying to help them draw a, a little architecture in their head. And to do that, you need to get a really clear view of what's in your head and think about what that map should look like at the end. So question number one, what's the smallest number of new concepts that I need to tell them so that they will understand them? And how are those concepts connected to each other? And is there some kind of familiar pattern that I can use to show people how they're connected? And I'll give you an example. So here's, here's what I took that text, transcription is bidirectional. And I said, I don't need, they don't need to know everything about gene expression. They just need to know a few things. They need to know that cells have this thing called transcription machinery. And it reads DNA sequences and it transcribes them into RNA sequences. And we used to think that that happened in one direction and now we learn that it happens in two directions. And those that has consequences because the RNAs are used to make proteins and have other functions. So, so that's all they need to know. They, the new thing is that we found that in, we used to think that transcription happens in one direction, and now we found out it can work in both directions. So, so that's what I want them to take away. And if they take that away, if I can build this in their heads, I don't care how they say it when they go out. The goal is the goal is that when every person goes out of this room after my talk, imagine there's somebody at the door and they say, what did she talk about? And everybody who comes out says, oh, so the guy outside says, oh, I really wanted to hear that talk, but I missed it. I overslept. Tell me what she talked about. Everyone who leaves the room should be able to give an answer to that question. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. But if you've helped them build this, they can use their own words and they will get it right. But first you have to see that. So you, this is kind of interesting. So how do we turn that into communication now? Well, there's several different things we have to do. But the main thing is, is to look at this and understand that people kind of know about this already in a certain way because there's a metaphor in here metaphor is based on the reading okay so we have a machine and it reads something it reads dna which is like a text 
And when it reads it, it transcribes that text. It, it rewrites that text into another, into another language of RNA. And so it needs to understand it and it needs to read it. And we used to think that it happened in one direction, but now it happens in two directions, like reading this text, okay? So if, that's, if I understand that's a pattern, here's, here's now how I'm gonna write the text. I'll show you how I rewrote this to try to make it better. Our DNA can be read backwards and forwards. Our cells specialize and cope with the challenges of life by producing different sets of molecules. They do this by drawing on different recipes in their DNA that they use to build RNAs and then proteins. This process begins when a cellular machine scans DNA and locates the instructions it needs for a particular molecule. The machine attaches itself at the beginning of that piece of code, reads it, and transcribes it letter by letter into an RNA molecule. Until now, scientists have thought that the recipes only made sense when read and transcribed in one direction, like this text. But scientists at Embel have now found that when it binds, the machine can often read and transcribe in both directions. So I've told the whole story, and now I have some extra time. I can even tell people how this was done. So the team discovered this while examining the entire set of RNAs that cells made. They found cases of molecules spelled forwards and backwards, starting from the same position in the genome, and so on and so on and so on. And now I can say what this means, and it raises some interesting questions. Now, if you look at the structure of this text, the beginning starts by trying to link this by, by setting up a context. It just gives people a little tiny bit of background to understand why we should care about this, why it's important. Um, it, it tells us what the, the overall goal is or the function. And then it uses these familiar patterns like recipes, scanning, instructions, transcribe. And interestingly, a lot of those words are the scientific words um, because science, your inner laboratory, doesn't have real things in it. It doesn't have a real tropin or whatever that molecule was called. It has a concept. It has a pattern. And so what we're doing in this text is we're saying, okay, what's the pattern that I'm using to think about this molecule or this process? Well, it's like a machine. It's, it, it's reading. None of those things are real. Everything in your, in your um, um, inner laboratory is like this. It's a metaphor. It's a, it's a pattern. And it's not the real thing. And if you know that, then you can, then you can use that pattern to explain it to somebody. I've also told the real story. So what did they really find and how did they do it? And now I have time to talk about what does it mean? What are the implications? What do we know? What can we do that wasn't possible before? And this is what you want to do in your presentation. And it will work just fine if you realize that you have to give people a little map, that that's what you're trying to communicate. I don't want them to remember any sentence of this. They can forget all of my words. They can translate it into a different language. I don't care. But they have to understand what it means. And understanding what it means means being able to recover that map. Now, I'm going I'm to just show you something, two more things really quickly, and then we'll take a little break before the next part, okay? The inner laboratory is metaphorical and conceptual. So seeing a pattern, if you understand that you're thinking in a certain way, like when I looked at the MRI image of the brain, I realized, wait a minute, I'm thinking of this a certain way. Let's see if I can think of it a different way. Maybe I'm missing something. So if I understand that the science in my brain is not a copy of reality, but it's a set of patterns and it's, and it's uh, uh, concepts, then I can do interesting things with that. So in this text that we just looked at, I thought, okay, transcription is like reading and writing. I compared transcription of an RNA molecule to reading and writing. So let me just think about the pattern of reading. What are things that happen when I read a book? Well, if I get to a boring place, I just skip it. Or if I didn't understand something, I go back and reread a sentence. Or maybe I see a passage that's important and I underline it. Or I take some notes on another piece of paper for later. Or I stop to take a phone call. Or I mark my page. My wife hates that. I always bend the corners of the pages in my books or I go back and reread a few pages, or I stop and look up something on, on Wikipedia or whatever. So those are all things that happen when I read. Now, I'm going to ask a really weird question, and, and that is, I wonder if the transcription machinery and cell do any of those things. Well, of course, they don't take a phone call. But, but what, would the, what would the corollary of that be for the transcription machinery? Maybe something 
interrupts it. it. Is it ever the case that the transcription machine is trying to make a DNA molecule that gets interrupted, it has to stop, and then when it's finished with that interruption, it goes back? I don't know, but maybe it's an interesting question. And I only thought of that question because I went into my inner laboratory and I said, I'm thinking of transcription like reading. What happens when I'm reading? And I promise you that in every course that I've ever given, when we start to think this way about your science, we can generate new questions that you've never thought of before just because we've cracked open the way that you're thinking about something. And that's really, really important. That's the connection. I told you at the beginning, I was gonna connect communication and research. And this is the first, this is the first really, really important place where they're connected. And I'm gonna show you one other way that they're connected. So I, I hope you get this. And if you don't, we'll, we'll have to think about this and talk about this a long time. But we're going to, I'm gonna be listening for the patterns in your talks. And first of all, I'm gonna listen. If there's something I don't understand, I'm gonna find the ghost and help you resolve it. And sometimes it's a ghost that you don't even know you have. Um, and the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the patterns that you're using to think about things. And I'm gonna ask myself, wow, I wonder if, a biological machine underlines an important passage. And if you ask a scientist, what would the equivalent be of transcription machinery? Well, it is a fact that a gene that has been transcribed once is more likely to be transcribed again. Somehow, the, this act of transcription marks the genomic region and makes it more likely that it'll be. So it's like highlighting it. So, so you can get a real science, you can get real science out of these kinds of games. And the other thing that you can do is, here's my map of gene expression. I printed this out on a large poster and I made, I took two darts and I started throwing darts at this. And one dart landed on the exon junction complex, which is a bunch of proteins that are stuck onto a site where splicing has happened and that can have different effects. And another um, uh, landed on chromatin. And so I asked myself, hmm, I wonder if there's any connection between chromatin and exon junction complexes. It's a question I never would have thought of. It, I just, it's a, it's a game. And I never would have thought of that except by random throwing darts at stuff. And if you look then, then you say, oh, I wonder what could the connection be? And you start to play this game in your mind and you can really come up with some interesting ideas this way. That's one thing. The other thing, and this is really the last thing I'm gonna show you, is that let's go back to our, so I had a student who was working on this question. What is the structural basis by which beta catenin binds to DNA? And what that meant was they were looking at this in terms of protein structure. So what is the protein structure of that? I, I don't think it actually binds. I think it, its partner left or something binds, but it doesn't matter. So they were looking at the structure of the protein. They were looking at its interaction partners and how that influenced the structure and how that permitted DNA binding. And the reason they were interested in this because they wanted to see how the same transcriptional co-activator could activate such different sets of genes and different tissues. And they thought it had to do with the complex that it was forming and, and something about its interaction with the transcription machinery. Okay, the student's task was to explain this to their grandmother, who was not a geneticist or molecular biologist. So, so what, what we did was we said, okay, first of all, realize that this is a real specific question that you have. And, but it's also, it's an example of more and more general questions. So the reason why we're interested in this, because we're interested in the activity of a transcription factor. And why are we interested in transcription factors? Because those influence which genes are activated. And that helps cells as they specialize, as they adapt, or during diseases. And we're interested, cell specialization is the way that very different cell types arise from a single cell or genome. Now, this, this chart has like three functions, okay? The first is that while you're working on this question, the reason you're working on it is because it comes from all of these different levels of models. So we have models of how transcription factors work. We have models of gene expression. We have models of cells and specialization. We have models of development. And 
what you're learning tells you not only something about beta catenin, but it also maybe tells you something really interesting about these higher levels of things. Maybe it tells you something about why cells respond to stress in a certain way. Or maybe it tells you something about the role in a particular disease. So, and, and so that's the first thing is, is that, that you're working on many different levels at the same time. And if something goes wrong in your experiment, it might be because we have the wrong idea about beta catenin, but it could also be because we have the wrong idea about gene activation or cell specialization. And a Nobel Prize winner wins a Nobel Prize because they understand that while they're working on a very small little question, they're also working on a huge, big problem. And if they, if you see how those two things are connected, you can discover something fantastic in the tiniest little projects. The other thing that this does is it tells you when you're discussing your results, you're going to discuss what you found out about beta catenin, but then you're going to try to move up as high as you can in this chart and say, okay, well, now we've learned something about cells' responses to stress, or we've learned something about this one type of cell, how it's specialized. You're, you're going to move up and sideways in the chart. And maybe this also tells us about something about how another transcription factor works, if I've learned this. Maybe something similar is going on to what I discovered. So that's for the discussion. That's the second reason why this chart helps. It'll help you scientifically. The third reason this chart helps is because it gives you a map to talk to your grandmother about your science. And so here's how that works. Grandma, you all know, you know a little bit about sex because you know you had you had a baby and, and that's my mom. Well, um, you, and you also so know that you know when when the sperm and the egg when the sperm fertilizes the egg that makes one cell and that egg grows and becomes your whole body and it becomes all these different types of cells it becomes have you ever seen a picture of a neuron it looks like a tree with like roots and branches and a, and a red blood cell looks like a donut and so we have all these different kinds have you ever wondered how that one cell can become all these different types of cells well it does that because each each cell has the same recipe book but it uses different recipes to cook up molecules and the different molecules give it these different shapes and functions and stuff. And the reason it uses different recipes is because it has these recipe, each cell has its own recipe readers who only like certain recipes and they don't like other ones. And I, those are called transcription factors. And I'm working on one of those that in called beta catenin and that recipe reader sometimes goes wrong in various different types of cells. And I'm trying to figure out why it goes wrong and why it decides in some cells to cook these molecules up and in other cells to cook these other molecules up. So, so I've just gone down this path. I started at the top and I said, okay, until I got to here and I gave her an idea of kind of what I'm doing, and of course, not in any detail. We have more time, we can get into that. Obviously, if you're talking to a group of molecular biologists, you're not going to start by saying, you all know that we begin as a single cell and, um, and uh, that cell develops into different types. No, but you can probably assume that scientists know what transcription factors are. But, but they may not know much at all about beta catenin. So you would start, so you know that um, transcription factors play a key role in gene activation. And I'm interested in a particular one called beta catenin. So it, different audiences, they just tell you, they just tell you what level to start at. Okay, so, so if you're talking to scientists, you could start down here if you're talking to and with students in the PhD program, there's gonna be some bioinformaticians who don't know much cell biology. There are gonna be some chemists there. There's gonna be maybe, maybe some sort of doctor types there. So you need to pick the right level, but this gives you a way to find that. Okay, we're gonna stop now, but let me just summarize really quickly. I have tried to show you that communication can be used as a tool to explore and expose hidden thinking in science and to improve your research. I've, I've suggested that what we're doing in communication is it's like a game board on which researchers work out models and how they should be applied to different systems and understand things. Communication in science is not just delivering facts, it's communicating the meaning of a scientific question or data requires relating it to other scientific concepts and models. The goal, the goal of all this is to help whoever your audience is build a little network of concepts 
that will help them later when they need to remember what you said. And to do that, you need to understand ghosts. You need to understand that there are ghosts in communication, and these are hidden patterns that you're thinking of that connect the information and give it meaning. Ghosts are inherent to all communication, and if they remain invisible, they have chaotic effects on thinking, communication, and even how you see things. And the best way to expose those ghosts is to communicate with different audiences. Because if you're talking to your grandmother, you need to use different metaphors than, than you would use with um, you would use with scientists or with somebody else. And when you use a different metaphor, if I if I stop talking about reading and I use, for example, scanning instead, then I can play with that idea. I can do the same thing like I did with that slide on. I can do this, but I've changed the metaphor. So that means I'm thinking about the same science. I'm, I'm doing a different experiment in my inner laboratory by changing the metaphor. Okay, so that is what we've done so far. And I'm going to put this up. We're going to take a like a 10 minute break now before we'll probably be joined by some others. And during the break, um, here I have a blog. It's good science writing wordpress.com and i've written a lot about these things that we're talking about and so you can find some articles there i also you, you if you get may get mails from me sometime that i've drawn some molecular biology cartoons i have about 500 on just about every topic in there um and and this map tool that i use is called cmap tools and um I'll, I'll give you the link i'll send you the link later um but you can download it and it's really easy to use and then there's a couple other books. We'll talk about those later. Um, anyway, so let's take a 10 minute break now. And when we come back, I'll take a couple of questions if you have any, and then we'll start the practical part of the course, which is an exercise that will really help you prepare to make your presentation. Okay, 10 minutes, see you.